I have explored Western lands, Western manners, and the depths of Western thought and Western learning to an extent which has rarely fallen to the lot of an Eastern mortal. But I have never lost touch with my Eastern heritage. Through all my successes and failures, I have learned to rely more and more upon the one true thing in all life, the voice that speaks in a tongue above that of mortal man. For me, the embodiment of that voice has been in the noble words of the Arabic Qur'an. These are the words found in the opening lines of the preface to perhaps the most celebrated English translation of the Qur'an. They are the words of a man of relatively humble origins, the son of an official of the Surat police force in India, who rose to rub shoulders with the intellectual and political giants of his age, who contributed widely to the social and intellectual history of India and Indian Muslims, the author of over 32 books and pamphlets, and over 200 articles, essays, reviews, and published lectures on subjects ranging from the economic history of India to the relationship of the Muslim world with the West in the critical age of colonization, these are the words of the restless soul Abdullah Yusuf Ali, who found his finest solace in the Qur'an. English-speaking Muslims today rely quite heavily on Yusuf Ali's translation of the Qur'an entitled The Meaning of the Glorious Qur'an. The commentary accompanying the heavy tomes is frequently deployed to grapple with passages requiring interpretive angles suggested by a modern age. Yet little is known about the translator and commentator other than that he was something of an international celebrity. What is one to make of his reading of the holiest texts of the Muslims if the details of his life are scarcely known? What sense of the world and self-understanding moved and shaped him? How was he raised? To which sect of Islam did he belong? What were his ideas and ideals? And how could a man of such high standing, trained at the leading institutions of the world and honored as commander of the British Empire, how could Sir Abdullah Yusuf Ali pass away alone in the lonely streets, unattended and abandoned in the harsh winter of the London of 1953? Born into a Daudi Bohra Muslim family of India in 1872 in the town of Surat in Gujarat, Abdullah Yusuf Ali lost his mother and his only sibling at a very young age. His sole caretaker was his father, who retired as a police inspector in Surat and devoted much of his life to raising Yusuf Ali as a conscientious Muslim. The father's emphasis on the study of the Qur'an must have shaped Yusuf Ali's religious and intellectual outlook from a very young age, for he writes in his preface to the Qur'an's translation, It was between the ages of four and five that I first learned to read the Qur'an's Arabic words, to revel in its rhythm and music and wonder at its meaning. My revered father taught me Arabic, but I must have imbibed from him into my innermost being something more, something which told me that all the world's most beautiful languages and literatures are but vehicles for that ineffable message which comes to the heart in a rare moment of ecstasy. It is this inner and deep devotion to the message, music, rhythm, rhyme, and ineffability of the Qur'an imparted to Yusuf Ali at the age of five that returned to him in his twilight years in the form of his canonical translation, The Meaning of the Glorious Qur'an. Between that first exposure to the scripture and the first words of translation he penned, a long and complex journey inflected his life. It shaped his sense of his own place and of the destiny of Muslims in the world. And the person he had to become along the way, one who deftly negotiated modernity and piety, reveled in and found stability and solace in the unchanging words of the Qur'an. Yusuf Ali's education was unusual for a member of the Bohra community. His father did not send him to a religious school, the Jamia Saifiya, as was the usual practice in those days. Instead, he matriculated the Anjuman -e Islam School in Mumbai, which was established by the Muslim community of the Presidency 
and was initiated by the celebrated Badruddin Tayyibji and some partners. The school was non-sectarian and included boys of all denominations with training in Urdu and English and a curriculum based on British principles of education. This early exposure to Western social, political, and intellectual traditions shaped much of Yusuf Ali's life. Thereafter, on the advice of Sir Frederick Lely, his father submitted a successful application of admission to the School of the Free Church of Scotland in Mumbai. Here he studied until 1887, when he was admitted to Wilson College on the strength of an arduous entrance exam in which he received the highest marks among the candidates. In 1891, the year of his graduation, Yusuf Ali's beloved father passed away. But he had left his son primed to climb the ladder of social, political, and intellectual success. The same year, Yusuf Ali was chosen as one of nine students to study in a leading university of Britain on a full scholarship. With a complete knowledge of the classics and mastery of English, Urdu, Latin, Greek, and some Arabic and Persian, Yusuf Ali decided on a path most upper-middle-class Indians chose during this era. He joined St. John's College at the University of Cambridge to read law. But the life of a wanderer that began at the age of six, filled with personal losses and an excruciating sense of loneliness, had already taken a toll. He could not concentrate on his studies and took a respite of two years and suffered his loneliness in perhaps the darkest period of his life. Then again, the tenacity of his character re-emerged from the rubble, and this young orphan regained his strength and sense of purpose. In 1893, Yusuf Ali sat for the Indian civil service exams. By all counts, this was unusual, as he was still an undergraduate. Yet more extraordinary is the fact that, in the initial phase, he was ranked 20th among an innumerable host in perhaps the most grueling recruitment exam in the world. In the final round, he was ranked 7th among the 65 final candidates. This success began Yusuf Ali's life as an accomplished scholar-administrator of the British Empire. The Indian Civil Service was the dream of practically every highly educated young man of India and of most British graduates of Oxford and Cambridge. Yusuf Ali was now in the ranks of such future leaders as Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Muhammad Iqbal, Jawaharlal Nehru, with some of whom he met and consulted throughout his career. His circle of friends would include such luminaries as Sir Sahib Zada Aftab Ahmad Khan, the Aga Khan Sir Sultan Muhammad Shah, Lord Allen of Hurtwood, Nawab Sir Ahmad Hussain Bahadur, Sir Thomas Arnold, Maharaja Sir Sayaji Rao of Baroda, Sir Shah Nawaz Bhutto, and Sir Mir Usman Ali, the Nizam of Hyderabad. For the remainder of his life, Yusuf Ali combined a high-profile status in public and government service with vast scholarship. He traveled to Europe, North America, the Middle East, and Africa, both for diplomatic missions and for delivering well-attended lectures. He published in the popular and strictly academic media, and he also served as an academic in the University of London School of Oriental Studies and as the principal of the Islamia College, Lahore. This was a life of a great and diverse set of achievements and productivity for a man constantly on the move. Yet more baffling is that Yusuf Ali was able to leave such an imprint on history despite his deeply troubled personal life. The loneliness that began with the death of his mother and brother at a very young age, that loneliness and desperation which was multiplied tenfold with his departure from home at the age of six, and which led to the brief collapse after his beloved father's death, that loneliness was his constant companion. Yusuf Ali's first marriage to an Englishwoman ended with her infidelity and divorce, and his children from this union were forever estranged from him. A similar fate befell him in his second marriage to another British lady. Thus the life of public celebrity and acknowledged scholarship 
was marred by a deep personal grief that would not ebb for more than a few moments. If one examines Yusuf Ali's literary output, one finds a constant thread, one that is both intellectually sincere and personally apt. As a modern reformist Muslim who straddled two worlds, the East and the West, he wished through his many works to demonstrate that in its purest and truest form, Islam is ecumenical, tolerant, compatible with and indeed cherished by whatever is good and noble in the West. It is also this Islam, read and interpreted in the proper way, that can give solace to the darkly tragic and abysmally hopeless personal life of a Yusuf Ali. Though the nuances of his positions on various matters shifted in the course of his intellectual development, he was an unfailing supporter of Muslims and Islam worldwide and he did his utmost to spread his scholarly investigations of the religion in academic and popular circles. He wished for an Islam that would be culturally and scientifically comfortable in the garb of modern Western traditions. Such an Islam can only come about by means of educational reforms. Among innumerable examples, one may cite his article Goethe's Orientalism, where he argues for the deep and sincere appreciation of this master of German literature for the spirituality of the East. Or we may read his article, A Plea for a Muslim University, where he tries to show the importance of a non-denominational Muslim university in India, one that would not only teach Islam, but will also inculcate a modern habitus. That India, particularly its Muslims, should be equal in their citizenship and rights by virtue of their service to the British Empire is passionately claimed in his article India's Services in the War and in his article India's Effort. Is it sufficiently understood that interconfessional lines of division can disappear if we focus on our common goals, misfortunes, and a common educational standard is stressed in his article, Our Immediate Future. In line with these views, he forcefully posits that Islam stood for the equality of the sexes and the fearless pursuit of truth in his article, Sister Religions. Finally, reform of Muslim culture in light of modern insights and demands is discussed in his article, Muslim Culture and Religious Thought in India. In this article, Yusuf Ali focuses rather heavily on the idea of a progressive interpretation of the Qur'an, one that is ultimately independent of the medieval tradition. Ultimately, this idea of a modern reading of the Qur'an, a reading that would give solace to him in his personal and public life, and that would serve as a guide to future Muslims, led to the production of his The Meaning of the Glorious Qur'an. This translation and commentary of the holiest texts of the Muslim faith is Yusuf Ali's maximum opus, and it is the book's most widely read English translation. In his preface of 1934, Yusuf Ali writes, That ambition to translate the book I have cherished in my mind for more than 40 years. I have visited places, undertaken journeys, taken notes, sought the society of men, and tried to explore their thoughts and hearts in order to equip myself for the task. Sometimes I considered it too stupendous for me. Two sets of apparently accidental circumstances at last decided me. A man's life is subject to inner storms far more devastating than those in the physical world around him. In such a storm, in a bitter anguish of a personal sorrow which nearly unseated my reason and made life seem meaningless, a new hope was born out of a systematic pursuit of my long-cherished project. Watered by tears, my manuscript began to grow in depth and earnestness, if not in bulk. Wanderer that I am, I carried it about thousands of miles to all sorts of countries and among all sorts of men. A haunted and burdened spirit seeking solace in the rhythms and universal call of a holy message permeates the translation. 
It seeks to harmonize its restlessness with the desire for stability. It wishes to justify liberalism in conservative passages. It finds progress and modern ideals in the religious doctrines and core of an ancient age. Through the Qur'an's message, it seems to reform the world and find peace for itself. And it succeeds in these tasks earnestly and without doing violence to the letter or spirit of the message of the Qur'an. Thus, for example, Yusuf Ali translates the oft-quoted chapter 9, verse 5 as, But when the forbidden months are past, then fight and slay the pagans wherever ye find them, and lie in wait for them in every stratagem of war. To this command that falls as absolute in its literal reading, Yusuf Ali adds the following comment. He says, The emphasis is on the first clause. It is only when the four months of grace are past, and the other party shows no sign of desisting from their treacherous design by right conduct, that the state of war supervenes. When war becomes inevitable, it must be prosecuted with vigor. In other words, Yusuf Ali gives precedence to the interpretive tradition that reads these passages contextually, not absolutely, and that understand the command as a reaction to hostilities, not as a license to initiate aggression. It is in these and in many other ways that Yusuf Ali tried to make sure that Muslims of the modern age read their scriptures with a view to its guiding spirit. He teased out the universality of the holy message beyond its particular verses and delivered it to the critical colonial and post-colonial age. Though he lived a life forlorn, dying, broken, and unrecognized by the world, in the cold London streets of 1953, his voice rings through the message of the holy text and continues to be heard by millions of Muslims around the world.